Okay, everybody, attention please, appreciate it. Um, welcome everybody to the 16th annual Beverly High School Sports Hall of Fame ceremony. Uh, certainly appreciate um, everybody being here on behalf of the kitty committee. Excuse me, I want to welcome everybody. Um, you know, certainly great evening we have in store for us, inducting eight great athletes and then honoring um, a super team this evening. And what I'd like to do to kind of start us off a little bit, please, um, is just for uh, members, if you could please stand when I call your name, I'd certainly appreciate it. Um, Fred Carnavali, Bob Fabry, Emily Morenzi, if we could hold our applause just to the end. I've got a lot of names, sorry. I should have probably said that in the beginning, right? So I apologize. Uh, Winston Treffery, Dave Bell, Andrew Morenzi, Todd Lampert, Roger Rosinski, Steve Costa, Fred Hammond, Tom Donovan, Roger Pierce, Bruce Nardella, Sean Barra, Tony DiVincenzo, Debbie Larson, Tom Rizaldi, Bill Hamer, Jack Ramari, and then just real quick, I know I missed one person, intentional, um, but anybody's name that I didn't read, if your name isn't Frank Forty. <laughs> okay, so last year, here's what we did. We had a very nice young lady whose birthday it was, and we all sang happy birthday to her. Well, history repeats itself tonight. Frank Forty is a young, 94 years old today. <laughs> Yep. And I wish I looked that good, by the way. And I think what we want to do is just do a quick happy birthday song for Frank on my count three, please. All right? Everybody up for that? All right. Awesome. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Excellent. It was good? Okay, so um, in addition to thanking everybody for attending tonight, we also wanted to, uh, to thank our advertisers uh, for their support uh, of the event and certainly, um, you know, in support of the, of the athletes. Um, so if, as you look through the programs, um, and, you know, please look through it, and if you have a need for the products and services, please keep it in mind. Um, again, we're very grateful for our advertisers. Um, I also wanted to just quickly introduce the committee and uh, thank them for their hard work and efforts. Um, you know, first I wanted to uh, introduce Steve Davidson, who's our, uh, our president of the committee, um, and um, certainly does a great job. He's uh, technically my boss, and I'm working on him for a long-term contract to be an MC. So do me a favor, put in a good word for me tonight, um, and hopefully we can figure that out. I also wanted to introduce you to um, Claire Hart, uh, longtime high school teacher and a Hall of Fame uh, English teacher in her own right. And uh, Claire, I am not saying that because you're critiquing my vocabulary after tonight's event, by the way. Well deserved, okay? Um, I also want to introduce Dave Jellison, our charming CFO and outstanding girls track coach. coach excuse me. Um, I also want to introduce Hal Gary. Hal, are you here? Oh, I guess he uh, slipped out, maybe uh, on duty. Um, also not here this evening because he's not feeling well is, uh, is Bill Poole, um, Nancy Patterson, and Deb Gary. And then I also want to make sure that I mention uh, Fred Hammond, um, another committee member, and um, certainly a, a terrific guy and member of the committee. So that is the, uh, the committee. My name is, uh, is Bernie Stavis, and I have the, uh, the pleasure of introducing some great athletes uh, in the team this evening. And uh, I'm not sure why I was elected to be MC. I'm, I'm still learning on the, on the job, and I took over for a uh, very talented uh, Steve Pia who did this for several years. And Steve is certainly the opposite of me. He's you know tall, good looking, thin, articulate, all that stuff. So I'm sort of learning on the job here. So um, just before we get started, um, what we're gonna do is just from a format perspective, we're going to have dinner, and then we'll induct the um, uh, Hall of Famers and, you know, honor the team um, after we eat. But one of the things that we like to do is like to highlight some of the great accomplishments from the girls and boys high school athletes. And there's a lot of great news to share um, as far as that goes. So in the fall, 
uh, we certainly saw a lot of girl power. The girls had a tremendous year. Uh, girls cross country was a perfect 7-0 and is undefeated for several straight seasons under uh, our friend Coach Jellison. Um, the soccer team with a record of 12-4 and four made the state tournament, tournament. The field hockey team won the NEC with a 13-4 and four record, also made the tournament. Our girls volleyball team went 14-6 and six and qualified for the state tournament. Uh, the golf team had an impressive season at 11-3, and, and then boys cross country also posted a winning record. Uh, for this winter, some great team accomplishments as well. Um, girls Indoor Track um, went a perfect 7-0 uh, seven, seven and oh, NEC champs. Uh, girls Basketball qualified for the state tournament with a 13-7 and seven record. Uh, gymnastics continues to post a winning record, um, a great team there. On the boys' side, the hockey team made the tournament with a 10-6-4 record. Boys Hoops was 15-5, and five, made the state tournament. Uh, the wrestling team was a strong again at a 5-1 record. Placed a couple wrestlers in the D2 sectionals. One wrestler actually placed in states and another in New England's, which is quite an accomplishment. Uh, boys indoor track recorded a winning record for the season. And the swimming team all, also finished a very strong and impressive uh, six and one. And then the spring team, you know, it's, it's sort of a bit of a, a challenge for when we talk about the spring teams, right? Because we're obviously the timing of the, of the banquet, of the ceremony. Um, so this is actually from last year, but want to make sure we don't leave them out. And there certainly was a lot of great accomplishments last year. Um, there was the, the girls track team went an impressive uh, six and one. The softball team made the tournament with a record of 16 and four. Girls tennis qualified for states with a 10 and four record. Uh, on the boys' side, boys' lacks had a winning record and made the North Shore Finals uh, under first-year head coach Jim Osalva, uh, class of uh, 1987, by the way. Not bragging, but uh, great job by Jimmy. Uh, the baseball squad had a 16-4 record and made it to the state tournament. Boys' tennis qualified for states with a 10-3 record. And then lastly, boys' track, the sailing and ultimate Frisbee teams all had winning records as well. So, again, some great accomplishments by our current high school athletes. Okay? Great. Um, Steve. Steve. Um, at, at this time, I'd like to ask Reverend, uh, Reverend Mott to come up and lead us in this evening's invocation, please. Shall we pray? Precious God, we first of all bring our honor and praise to you. The beauty around us in this spot is just a faint glimpse of the glory of your beauty and love, goodness, and purity. But we also gain of it a glimpse of your, in your human creation. We think of technology, arts and literature, but also skills of excellence in athletics, including those honored tonight and in the past. We think not only of their physical physical prowess and skills, but also their gift of character. Their accomplishment was achieved through a discipline of body and self. They continued and strove violently even when their faces were marred by dust and sweat and blood. We think of the personal sacrifices they made for their team, for the school and our city. Bless their lives now. May they continue with your help to achieve excellence and opportunities before them. May each of them, may us also, use our gifts from you to help others in their struggles. Help us use the same discipline in our moral life that we use in our physical life. Most of all, may we bring praise and honor to you, O giver of life in all its fullness. Now and forever, may we put our trust and hope in you, our dear Lord and Savior. Amen. Okay, all right, so we are going to get started. And this is where we um, certainly pick things up a little bit and start to um, learn and hear from some of the great inductees, uh, as well as uh, honor the uh, team this year, football team this year. 
And uh, to help kick things off, I want to ask, there he is, Roger Pierce to come up. Uh, Roger is an American Idol finalist and is going to lead us in our school song. Which, of course, you're going to ask, oh, I wish I knew the words. Don't worry, it's on page 41 of your programs. Okay? So, Roger, take us, take us away, sir. Thank you, Bernie. I know a lot of you are here specifically tonight to do this song, so we want to hold up just a little bit here and let you know that, again that it's on page 41. You want to open that up because most of you have never sung it before in your life, right? Okay? <laughs> We're going to do it tonight. Going to do it right. Billy asked me if I could uh, originally, can I play it on piano? I said, I don't play piano. I can play it on a 12-string guitar. They would not provide me with an amplifier or everything to plug in, so that's out. So I'm going to have to just wing it. Honey, is my phone back there? <laughs> I'll grab it. I'll grab it. You got it. Oh, there it is. Oops. I tell you, it's not easy getting old either. All right, so here we go. So, because this is the electronic age, and we're going to simplify this, we're going to start it off with, and it's not exactly like in your book, so just hesitate for a few moments when we start. Jump in when it sounds comfortable, okay? Can you do that? Okay. How many people are here right now? Can I have a show of hands? <laughs> Almost everybody. All right, here we go. This will be the amplifier. All right. Okay, folks, we're going to do this a cappella. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, it'll be out of the key of G. Is that good for everybody? Oh, wait a minute. A flat. Is that better? A little bit higher for you. Okay, here we go. On three. One, two, three. Onward, oh, onward, for Beverly High, with our voices strong and clear. Excellent. Long may we cherish her faithful will be to our Elma. Oh, that sounds so nice. Hail to our heroes, her loyal sons and true. Let our hearts be now you. We'll always play fair and the high ideas we'll share for dear old Beverly High. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. Okay, so um, this uh, this evening we're gonna nominate. Um, excuse me. Introduce our first inductee, Bill Kerwin, class of 1955, football, hockey, and track. Bill was a three sports star during his time at BHS. On the gridiron is where Bill really shined and distinguished himself as one of the top all-time running backs at BHS. Bill used his size and exceptional speed that resulted in many long touchdown jaunts during his career, including an 80-yarder in the 50th game win against Salem. Life after his illustrious BHS career included earning a football scholarship at BC, joining the U.S. Army, and he founded as an author of uh, nine, a journal of baseball history and culture. Um, introducing Bill this evening uh, is his daughter, Suzanne. Um, Bill has, uh, has passed on, uh, but let's uh, have a warm welcome for Suzanne in honor of her father uh, into the Belly High School Hall of Fame. My dad, Bill Kerwin, passed away in 2007 after a remarkable year-long battle with brain cancer. He was an extremely kind, complex, talented, innovative, and accomplished man. For him, high school, and in particular sports in high school, marked the beginning of the realization of his life's potential. At Beverly High School, Billy Kerwin was a member of the Current Events Club, the Projectors Club, and the Auto Drivers Club, and the uh, Extinguishers Club, I've learned tonight, the Fire Extinguishers Club. <laughs> he was class president and an engaged participant with the Student Service Corps. He was captain of the track team and a decorated sprinter. He also played basketball, hockey, baseball, and above all, he was the star running back of the greatest team
team that Beverly High School football had ever seen in 1954-55. I can't tell you about his high school rushing yards, his passing records, receiving yards, and touchdowns, though I believe they were many and no doubt of paramount importance to him at the time and the reasons, of course, for this reward. But I can tell you how the culmination of his athletic experience in high school provided the foundation for shaping his future and the impact sport had on his life, the person he was, son, brother, friend, and the person he became, husband, father, colleague, professor, grandfather. Bill Kerwin grew up in less than idyllic circumstances in the 1940s and 50s. His stories about his boyhood invariably around, uh, revolved around his father, a figure my dad recalled without warmth. My dad, though, was endlessly gentle and sensitive and a rumpled teddy bear of a man. He was utterly disarming. My grandfather, evidently, was something altogether different to my dad. A story dad often told, a deeply etched memory of conflicting emotions, is of his father drilling him to make, uh, to make drive, diving catches of a football to get used to the pain and to shrug off injury. Young Bill would have to jump, off, or jump over two feet of shrubbery to catch the ball. If he fell down on the sidewalk, which was on the other side, and started to cry, my grandfather would say, you know, no nigger would ever cry, so you don't ever cry. That was drilled into him. In an era burgeoning with great conflict surrounding racial discrimination, Young Bill always saw his father's remark as some kind of backhanded respect for what black people were going through in this country. Though my grandfather never called them blacks or, or even Negroes. And this disparagement was a notion that Bill Kerwin could never get comfortable with. My grandfather worked at the shoe. The expectation was that my dad would also one day take a job there, perhaps after high school. But Billy had other ideas, and through sport, he recognized the world of opportunity he could avail himself by getting an education. There was no pre uh, precedence, however, in his family of further education, and certainly no money available for tuition. He knew the only way this sort of opportunity would materialize for him was through an athletic scholarship which he in fact received for football to Boston College. While playing college ball, my dad suffered a badly broken leg. Working on his re rehabilitation and whiling away wintertime hours, gimpily shooting baskets in the Boston College gym, my dad met a young man a few years younger than him. This fellow basket shooter turned out to be Sammy White, the first string catcher of the Boston Red Sox. Bill, the college kid, was apparently then, as he was until the day he died, instantly endearing. White took a liking to him. As their friendship grew, White invited him to come hang out at the Red Sox clubhouse during the season. My dad, a Red Sox fanatic, was, of course, thrilled. The first time Sammy White brought young Bill to Fenway Park Clubhouse, he introduced him around to the various teammates. My dad recalled most ball players as giving him a perfunctory handshake, taking no real interest in the gawky college kid. But when Bill was introduced to Ted Williams, his intimidation was immediately swept away when the living legend, the Teddy Ballgame, looked him in the eye and talked with him seriously and respectfully engaging him about his college studies, asking about his athletic pursuits, and his family. It was, of course, one of the most memorable moments in my young dad's life. Not everyone reported a positive experience when struck by the sheer force of Ted Williams' distinct personality. And my father certainly did not get to know Ted Williams well, but he seemed to immediately understand Williams in a way that not many did. When he spoke of Williams, Dad would hone in on Williams' miserable childhood and the unhappy relationship with his father and the manner in which that tension always burned within Williams and always animated him. Bill Kerwin and Ted Williams 
uh, different in so many obvious ways, born a generation apart, shared something deep. Sometime later, but while still in college, my father went to a Boston hospital to visit a seriously ill friend. To his astonishment, he found Ted Williams there visiting the friend as well. Suddenly bursting into the hospital ward came a TV cameraman and a reporter who'd gotten wind of Williams' presence, ready to film the star athlete visits the sick segment for the evening news. Williams violently confronted the TV crew, presenting obscenity-laced threats of intense physical harm if they so much as shot one second of film or even thought about reporting Williams' visit in the newscast. Williams' enraged expl explanation of why he would not permit publicity was simple. He said, I don't do this because I have to. Or sorry, I don't do this because I want to. I do this because I have to. My dad understood. In Williams, the wealthy superstar, didn't choose to do work, good work, for the sake of his reputation. Instead, Williams, the once poor, half Mexican kid from a broken home, was compulsively driven to give help and support to those in need. It was a moment of profound clarity for my father. And paired with the chronic effects of his leg injury, it was a defining event in his ensuing decision to turn down an in invitation to the New England Patriots training camp in order to further his education and, per and pursue a career in the field of social work. So sports, and ultimately football, became my, uh, my dad's vehicle out of the social status quo, working class society, and a lifetime of manual labor at the United Shoe Machine Factory all thanks to his opportunities and success at Beverly High School. Opting to enlist in the Army so he could choose a posting in Germany where he could play hockey, my dad also met and married my mother. They eventually moved to Utah where my sister was born, then California where I was born, and shortly after that, we all moved to Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, where he lived until his death. He received a master's degree in social work and later a PhD. He established the Edmonton Division of the University of Calgary's Faculty of Social Work at the University of Alberta campus where he enjoyed a long and prolific academic and teaching career. But his proudest professional achievement was the founding and development of his academic publication called Nine, a journal of baseball history and culture. Around the time his father died, he started thinking about either writing a journal or writing about baseball or developing a journal around it. The death of his father prompt him, prompted him to want to make sense of his childhood memories of him as the best recollections of his father were actually associated with baseball. Through nine, Bill was unsurpassed in finding, encouraging, and inspiring others to submit serious, superior quality academic articles that study baseball across a variety of disciplines and from a range of social perspectives. Many of the papers were also presented at the nine spring training conference held each year in Arizona. Now, a quarter century later, his legacy lives on as both the journal and the conference continue with expanding subscribership and attendance. My dad brilliantly parlayed his love and experience with sport into things that were incredibly meaningful to him. From understanding his childhood, to teaching, parenting, making meaningful friendships, and even in academia, sport was a constant in his life and ultimately a means of reconciliation for him. Thank you for this honor and this recognition. And to Fred Carnavalli, fellow inductee and the quarterback who was responsible for those touchdowns getting into my dad's hands, thank you for putting his name forward. I'll close by sharing one of Bill Kerwin's favorite aphorisms. These few words serendipitously embody his life story. The purpose of sport in life is not to teach us how to win, but rather to show us that even though we are going to eventually lose, to attempt to delay the loss 
is the human condition. Okay, Bill Kerwin, class of 1955. Um, our next inductee, Mr. Bob Peroni, class of 1959, basketball player and coach, track. Bob played for legendary basketball coach George Taylor and was known as a tenacious defender and steady scorer, much like his grandkids, I'm sure, with us to this evening. He was a three-year varsity player and was an integral part of the team that qualified for the highly prestigious tech tourney at the Boston Garden. Pressure situations brought out the best in Bob, demonstrated by his ability as a scorer in big moments and relied upon to handle the basketball when it mattered the most. He also applied his knowledge and love of the game at BH as BHS coach from 1972 to 1975. In track, Bob was a top mile runner for BHS and a key contributor to the Essex County Championship team during his junior year. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bob Peroni to the BHS Hall of Fame. Good evening, everybody. I hope you're having a wonderful time. I am so honored to be here this evening. Before I begin, I had a brief conversation with my very good friend, Jack Romari. Um, it was small talk, a lot of general conversation, and then Jack came up with a whole bunch of suggestions for me for this evening. One of which was, make it shut. <laughs> so Jack, wherever you are, I'm going to entertain your suggestion. <laughs> All right. <laughs> First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Selection Committee for my nomination to the Hall. It's certainly an honor and a privilege to be associated with so many elite athletes that have gone through Beverly High School, and uh, I'm just super, super happy to be, to be in this situation. I would also like to congratulate the other members that are being inducted into the Hall this evening. I must think I'm a little more nervous than I am tonight than I was 60 years ago when I first set foot on the parquet floor of the Boston Garden to play a basketball game before some 9,000 fans. That was truly a tremendous honor and a memory I shall never forget. I know that many of you in the audience uh, will recognize, recognize the names that I'm going to mention to you. Uh, names like Billy Hamer. Johnny Ryan. Oh boy, there's a few more. <laughs> oh, I got one. Tony, Tony DiVincenzo. <laughs> Mikey Tomio. Gordy Reed. Emily Woodwicky. Guess what, people? They were all members of the Beverly High School Hall of Fame. But I know something that probably you guys don't know. They were also members of the class of 1959. What a great class that was. All right. 1959 was a great year also for Beverly basketball. We were one of the top teams in the Essex County League. We qualified for the Tech Tourney in Boston. We went on to play three games in the Boston Garden. The first game was with New Bedford Vocational High School. Um, believe me, an excellent basketball team. They had two basketball players, both brothers, the Gomes brothers. One of the brothers went on to play for the Harlem Globetrotters for a few years. It was a hard fought game, a very close game, uh, but we ended up winning that game 42 to 40. The second game was against Weymouth High School. Weymouth High School was the tallest team in the Tech Tourney that year. They had a front court of 6-3. Our tallest player was Teddy Doucette. And if we, were, if we were able to stretch Teddy, we'd be lucky to get him to six feet. We were completely undersized to Weymouth. But let me tell you, we embarrassed them. We ended up winning that game 55 to 50. I distinctly remembering the very next day 
after the Weymouth game, reading an article in the Wrecked American. For you younger people, the Wrecked American is now the Boston Herald. The article said, watch out for Beverly High School. They may just walk away with the whole tournament. The third game was the semifinal, semifinal game of the Tech Tourney. The winner of that semifinal game would now go into the final game of the, uh, of the tournament. Before I go any further, I must mention the fact that the third, the third game we played Everett High School. Everett was in fact picked to win, that, uh, to win the tournament. The winner of that semifinal game would now have the opportunity to play in the final game and a chance to win the Class A Eastern Massachusetts Basketball Championship. We were that close. We ended up, we ended up losing that, uh, that game uh, and for some reason, even to today, I have a very difficult time in remembering the score of that game. I would, remiss, I would be remiss if I didn't mention our basketball coach, Coach George Taylor. Uh, Coach Taylor is no longer with us, but in my estimation, he was probably one of the most knowledgeable basketball coaches in the state of Massachusetts and maybe even beyond. In closing, I would just like to say that it was certainly an honor and a privilege to play for Beverly High School. It was certainly an honor and a pleasure to come back and coach the teams that I once played for. My induction this evening allows me to leave a legacy, a legacy to my entire family. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but especially a, leg a legacy to my grandkids. They now can go up to Beverly High School. They can see the Hall of Fame wall. They can see the plaque on the Hall of Fame wall that says Bob Peroni, and they can say, that's my grandfather. Thank you very much. Um, the next inductee, Terry Irwin, class of 1964, basketball, football, track. Terry was a three-year varsity basketball standout and track star highlighted by a personal best, 100-yard dash, and 10 seconds flat. On the football field is where Terry thrived the most. As one of the best running backs in BHS history, Terry was a tough and physical runner with track star speed. During his junior year, he scored three touchdowns against Thanksgiving Day rival Salem. As a senior, he rushed for 234 yards versus Gloucester and had three three touchdown games during that season. Terry went on to play football at Boston College where he won a prestigious award for athleticism and character and he was also drafted by the AFL Denver Broncos. Um, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Terry Irwin, who couldn't join us this evening, um, please welcome Hall of Famer and friend Tom Donovan, who will come up here and say a few kind words about Terry. Have a seat, Bernie. No, all right, all right. No. <laughs> we'll be in hell. Uh, Bob Peroni. <laughs> My brother Danny, you said you played before 9,000 fans. My brother Danny and Johnny Most would tell you back then I held 13,909 was a magic number. Yeah, but I left that part out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on behalf of, of Terry, uh, the first thing I'd like to do is join him in congratulating all the other inductees going in tonight. Congratulations. Well deserved. Also, the committee for all the hard work you do, he want to make sure I thank you people. A lot of work goes into it, and uh, he thanks you all for the committee. It's a lot of tough decisions, I know. Terry Irwin, the football player. If you read the program, no question about it, he's one of the best backs to come out of Beverly. Eight and one their junior year. He played with a young man named Bippy Manuel. Program says they lost to Haver opening game. I, I question that. They lost to Brookline 22 to 20, if I remember correctly. They lost to Brookline down the Tech Tourney the same year by two points, too. But Terry was a great running back. His senior year, 
After three games, he was actually leading the state in scoring. I think he got like three touchdowns the first three games each game. Then he rolled his ankle in the fourth game. And the rest of the season was kind of tough for Terry. So when it came to recruiting for colleges, he was a little nervous about it. And he went to Roy Norton, his coach back then. And Roy told him, don't worry, I got your back. We're going to send some game films out. Where do you want to go? And he told him, I don't want to get on a plane. I want to play someplace local. So Roy sent the tapes out. And he told Terry, go see the coaches. They get your films. So Terry makes his journey out. He starts with the first college. and sits down with the coach to watch the film and he looks at the film he goes what film did he Terry didn't really have a bad game but the film he's looking at isn't one of his best games and this goes on for his first three visits each coach has the same tape and it's not his best game so now he gets to his fourth and final college Boston College I might want to add here this is where Roy Norton went to college and played football and he really wanted Terry to go there so he sends the coach at BC Three tapes, all his best games. <laughs> BC had one scholarship left. After watching the three tapes, they gave him the only scholarship that was left. And hence, there he goes off to BC. Terry had a, a great enough career to be drafted by the Denver Broncos. Played offense, played defense, did a little of everything. The biggest thing he was the most proud of, though, was accepting to be the recipient of the Thomas Scanlon Award, which went to the top athlete scholar of the uh, football team every, every year. So he was the biggest thing he was proud of. Found out that Terry, after his sophomore year, got married, and he ended up taking a job. He worked his schedule out at school so he could work 3 to 11 at the Hotel Hawthorne at the desk, as a desk clerk. He did that for five nights to support his family. After graduating from BC, he went on to Denver. His quarterback at BC, Joe DeVito, was also drafted by the Denver Broncos. They also had another teammate in the backfield named Brendan McCarthy, who got drafted by the Green Bay Packers, traded to the Atlanta Falcons, and then got traded to the Denver Broncos. So one of the preseason scrimmages, Joe DeVito, the backup quarterback, got a shot when the starting quarterback got hurt, DeVito went in. Floyd Little, who was their franchise player, rode his ankle. Terry Irwin got to go in. So the line coach at the time told the head coach, Lou Saban, hey, you put that McCarthy kid in, you got the whole BC starting backfield. And Terry thinks this might be a trivia question down the road. So they put McCarthy in there, and they had the whole BC starting field. It might be the first time ever done in a pro football game a preseason. So that's something Terry's proud of, too. But anyways, Terry said at the time, back in 1969, it wasn't much money. Floyd Little, the franchise player, was getting $30,000 at the time. He goes, so you can imagine what I was making. At the end of the year, with the family to support, he had an offer to take a job on Colorado for double the money. And that was the end of his football career. He's also very proud of the fact that his younger brother, Bobby, who graduated with me in 66, went to BC. He set many track records at Beverly, went on to BC and, and broke some track records also. He's proud of that fact of his younger brother. I'll close with one last story. Fast forward, Terry's daughter goes to BC on a swim, swimming scholarship, and she sees a football team, and she sees this young man with a certain number. She goes up to him, and she goes, hey, my father wore that number back in the 60s. He was pretty good. You better be pretty good. And the kid looked at her and says, I'll do the best I can. The kid's number was number 22. The player, Doug Flutie. <laughs> Thank you for tonight. Enjoy talking to you. All right. <laughs> Terry Irwin, class of 1964. Thank you, TD. By the way, I think we have two of the greatest sports, Beverly sports historians in this room tonight. Certainly TD and then Coach Hamer. It's amazing how much they can recite from many years ago. So uh, again, thank you very much, TD. <laughs> okay, Barry Lewis, class of 1981, basketball, soccer, trek. Barry was part of a very talented basketball team in the early 80s as a consistent defender, scorer, and rebounder. 
One of his many highlights included a 20-point effort in a big first-round tournament victory over Concord Car Carlisle. As a soccer star, Barry was a three-year starter as a sweeper in which he possessed rare scoring skills at that position and was a captain his senior year. He was also elected as a, an indoor track captain and was a top performer in the high jump with a career best six foot four, six foot four inch jump, which literally means you could jump over himself. <laughs> Barry was voted best overall senior for the class of 1981 and earned a commendation from the National Merit Scholarship Program. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Barry Lewis, class of 1981, to the BHS Hall of Fame. Thanks, everyone. They said I had to take a seven to eight minutes here, so I want to take some time unfolding my paper. And <laughs> if we want to do another bout of the school song, I'm up for it. <laughs> All right. So first, thanks to the Beverly High Hall of Fame Selection Committee. I appreciate the nomination, being elected to the Hall of Fame. Also, congratulations to the rest of the nominees who are coming in uh, this year as well. Coming into this event, you know, I'm kind of a quiet guy. I like to sit in the back. I don't really like a lot of attention. So they told me I had to come up here and talk. And I'd never been to a Hall of Fame speech before, so I asked my good friend Bob Forrest, you know, what goes on at these things and what do people talk about? So he, he kind of gave me, you know, a few things to say, you know, talk about your teammates, talk about your coaches, and, uh, you know, if you can tell a funny story, that would be great. <laughs> so I'll try. We'll see how it goes. I played three, four, three sports in Beverly High uh, on some really, really good teams. Had some great coaches, and it's been close to 40 years ago. Uh, it was back 1978 to 1981, so take some of my memories with a grain of salt. I was fortunate to have Bill, Co Bill Foley, Buzza, as my soccer coach, Keith Arnold was my basketball coach, and Jack Hilton was my track coach. Both Buzzer and Jack particularly really stood out as guys that I really enjoyed playing for. Um, they were tough, high energy guys, explosive. Um, but they always were encouraging and supportive and really made things fun for the players. Every year in each of the three sports we were either winning conference championships or at least threatening to. Each sport had a totally different feel and a different cast of characters. Uh, I always enjoyed transitioning from one sport to the next because it was something totally new. Every, every, uh, every three months we rolled into the next sport and everything stopped and something else was starting. So talk a little bit about our soccer team. We were really never known for subtle technique soccer. We were always hustling bunch of overachievers. Uh, we developed a reputation for playing really hard. And in some, some cases, uh, there was definitely some talk of us being a little bit dirty. <laughs> Here I was, a tall, skinny guy. I uh, really didn't look the part of being a tough, rough guy. So, you know, I used the eye black. I did the best I could to fit the mold. One thing we did do though is win. We tied for the NEC championship my sophomore year. We just missed it my junior year on a team that was loaded with seniors. That was the year we made it to the first Eastern uh, Massachusetts conference or uh, championship at Boston University. And I remember that game well. It was probably midway through that game, the ball came rolling to me 25, 30 yards out. Johnny McKenna was standing right next to me and we both had a chance for it. He kind of looked at me, we w gave a nod, I went for it. The ball took just a tiny little hop. I nailed it as hard as I could and flew it 
over that goal post or over the net by a mile. <laughs> we ended up losing that game and uh, Coach Foley came up to me later and asked me why I put it out on the Mass Pike. <laughs> My senior year, we came back with a really inexperienced team. Um, I think we ended up surprising a lot of people. We won the conference title outright for the first time in soccer history for Beverly High. Um, again, we made it back to BU and did well. We didn't win it, but it was a great experience for everyone. I'll just toss a few names out, guys that were I played with uh, growing up as a sophomore, Mike Cahill, Mark Durgan. As a junior, Richie Schimmel, Freddie Paglia, Ricky Bright, and then as a senior, Zeke Giswaldi, Mike Whalen, Steve Pia, Doug Vigliotta, Brian Norris, all guys that helped make us uh, successful. Then when I transitioned into basketball, it was totally different. We weren't young, uh, inexperienced guys anymore. All of a sudden, I was uh, just a piece of the puzzle on a team with some really uh, incredible players. Peter Wynn, Timmy Hayes, Mike Vescucci. Uh, that was my senior year. Before that, Bobby, Michelle, Billy Hayes. Uh, we had a lot of really talented guys. Um, every year, we contended for the title. And every year, we kind of got pushed back a little bit by Lynn Classical. They had some amazing talent on that team as well. and. Uh, but nevertheless, we, uh, we went on to many tournament games. Uh, there was one against Pat Ewing that we played my junior year. I can't say I played a lot in that game, but uh, it was a great game to be at. And uh, I think Peter Wynn did a, a remarkable job as well as Timmy and Billy. In some ways, track was one of my favorite sports um, just because of the way the whole team got along. For an individual sport, Got a group of guys getting together. It was amazing to me how the track team, that, those particular track teams bonded and formed a, a team together. Uh, I'm pretty sure that we won the conference championship my sophomore and, uh, and junior years. And we went on to just barely lose it, I think, on a baton toss my senior year. Peter Dooling, George Daly, Steve McCray, Brian Hirschfeld were all some of the key performers on those teams. So I'm going to tell a little story about, about uh, a little bit about my coach, Jack Hilton, who was a guy that I really loved uh, playing for. He was our track coach. And I think it was my junior year, a couple of us were kind of screwing off a little bit. Uh, we saw a springboard that they used for gymnastics over uh, tucked away in a corner of the field house. So, you know, being the knuckleheads we were, we went and grabbed the springboard and brought it over in front of the high jump mat. Decided doing flips over the bar and having a little fun. So then Jack comes over. I'm like, oh, God, we're, we're going to put an end to this, right? But that wasn't the case. Jack decided we're going to make this into something. We're going to take this to another level. So he wanted us to start doing high jumping off the springboard. Um, so the first time I did it, I flew out there, hit the springboard, flew up over the mats, barely hit the edge of the mat as I rolled onto the ground. And I got up and I was like, oh my God, that was awesome. <laughs> so instead of, you know, stopping, we took the mats, we moved them all to the back left of the pit, and we went on and rose, raised the bar up, raised the bar up, raised the bar up, and just, uh, we had a lot of fun. You know, looking back at it now, it was kind of silly and a little bit dangerous. And uh, I think uh, Jack might have got a talking to from Roy Norton at some point because that springboard was never around again. <laughs> but here's the thing about Jack. The next year, my senior year, in the newspaper, Jack tells everybody that I've been over seven feet off the springboard that we use for training purposes. <laughs> So finally, thanks to my friends and family for coming tonight. I appreciate it. It's great to have you guys here. Um, I'm not sure if there's an age that you reach where it seems weird to thank your parents, but I want to do that. Thanks to my mom and dad for the commitment that you had made. 
my mom can't be here tonight, but my dad's here, and appreciate you being here, Dad. Um, you know, if there's one trait that I had that helped me in my athletics, I was pretty uh, stubbornly competitive out on the field, and I think I got a lot of that from my dad. So thanks a lot, and thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Okay, the next inductee, Joe Miller, class of 1984, football and track. Joe has earned the distinction as one of the top receivers in BHS history with 59 receptions and over 1,000 receiving yards during his illustrious football career. And this, of course, was accomplished in the Bill Hamer offense, which makes these statistics even more impressive considering the run-oriented, no offense, coach, I'm just saying, you love to run. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Um, so, um, you know, legendary, Roy, legendary coach, excuse me, Roy Norden gave Joe very high praise. And to obviously get Coach Norden's praise, you've truly earned it. Uh, he had this to say, he was one of the best receivers I've seen here in a very long time. Again, I can't stress how much of a testimonial that truly is. Um, football highlights for Joe included NEC All-Star in a five-catch and 112-yard performance versus Lynn Classical. Um, in track, you know, Joe certainly also showed his versatility, not only as a tight end in football, a great defensive player, um, but he was a valuable part of an undefeated track team. And his versatility was shown by things such as competing in the high jump, 100-yard dash, or as a sprinter. And he was also a member of the conference best 4x110 relay team. Um, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the late Joe Miller, please welcome Hall of Famer and friend, Steve Pascucci, who will have the honor of helping us induct Joe into the BHS Hall of Fame. <laughs> Uh, good evening, my name is Steve Pascucci, class of 1984, very proud uh, graduate of Beverly High School. Uh, before I talk about Joe and also make a few thank yous, I want to give a shout out to the current head coach at Beverly High School, Andrew Morenci. I contacted Andrew uh, a couple of days ago and I asked him if I could get uh, the number 44 Beverly football jersey, which was Joe Miller's number. And uh, Andrew dropped everything, um, and he had actually told me that the shirts are being reconditioned right now, so the actual game shirts would not be available. But he would go to the high school and uh, see what was still around, uh, jerseys from years ago. Um, it didn't, there were jerseys there, 44 wasn't there. Uh, I would have been very proud to put on the number 44. Um, I would have instantly got better looking and more athletic. But... Um, <laughs> I just want to say thank you to Coach Andrew Morenci for even trying to do that. Um, I follow every sport at Beverly High School. I don't live in Beverly, I live in Concord, but I follow all the sports. I know all the kids. I know who's on the softball team, whose last name is Hamer right now. Uh, but you're in good hands with uh, Andrew Morenci. Um, for my speech, uh, before I talk about Joe, I want to echo what Mr. Peroni said, what Barry Lewis said, and what Mr. Donovan said. Um, thank you very much to the committee. For, uh, for inducting Joe this year. Um, it was a welcome surprise and a very happy morning when I got that phone call in uh, December to say that Joe got in. I want to give a special thanks to Bill Poole. Uh, Bill's my contact person on the uh, committee. He made that phone call. Bill's a longtime neighbor of mine and my, my mom. We grew up in Centerville on Essex Street right around the corner from Bill on Pine Knoll Drive and he invited me over his house to uh, hand off some information and it was a thrill to see him. Um, and I also want to say congratulations to everybody else who has come up here and will come up here tonight. Um, as we all know, Beverly High School has a decades-long history of excellence in athletics. Um, all the teams, male, female, uh, the players, the coaches, um, I, I, the list is endless. So to be up here um, and to be in this uh, Hall of Fame is quite a testament to, uh, to all the athletes. So for my, um, for my friend Joe Miller, Joe passed away in uh, 2011, I'm going to dedicate this induction speech to his son Christian, who's a Beverly High graduate, class of 2016, who's a phenomenal football player and also a very good baseball player. Joe was born uh, January 20th. 1966, 
Joe grew up on uh, right around the corner from uh, Stone Street, right around the corner from um, Independence Park and Cabot Street. Uh, he participated in Beverly Midget football, like a lot of us did back in the late 70s. Played for Coach DeRubio, I think he was on the Patriots back then. <laughs> Joe worked his way up to um, Pop Warner football where he played for Coach Churchill. And then he went to Briscoe Junior High uh, where he played for Coach John Allen who later was one of his coaches at Beverly High School. Uh, in the fall of 1981, Joe entered Beverly High School where he hit the big time. Um, at that time, there were two junior highs in Beverly Briscoe Memorial and we merged that year. So people like myself, Sean Barr, Tommy Hayes, Pat Murphy from Memorial, along with John Pewter, Gary Cowles, Joe Miller from Briscoe. We were rivals in junior high, but we were very close friends in high school. We played on a JV team that year, our sophomore year. I think we went 8-0. Uh, and the most important thing about that year was how close we all became. Uh, we were instant friends both on and off the field. And even today, I'm proud to call all those guys my friends. The next year was Joe's junior year. And under the leadership of two uh, incredible captains, one of them right across from me, Billy Hamer Jr., who's a phenomenal linebacker, one of the best linebackers in the history of Beverly High School, and Beverly High always has good linebackers, and Randy Shields, who was a phenomenal, phenomenal tight end. He played opposite Joe Miller, and thank you for coming here tonight, Randy. Joe hit the big time in his first game against Everett at Everett. He caught a touchdown pass from Danny McLeod, who's a great quarterback, great athlete, and that was just the beginning for Joe. Uh, two games later, we lost to Lynn Classical at home, but Joe was the player of the week for the entire North Shore, which was the Northeast Conference, the St. John's Prep, the Cape Ann League schools. He had five catches for 112 yards, and people just looked around and said, who's this guy, number 44, Joe Miller? Uh, he had several other touchdowns that year. Uh, finished strongly against uh, Salem. We, we lost that game at the end of the year against a very powerful team. Um, Salem had John Keenan among others who everyone will recognize but Joe finished the year great and he was determined as we all were that next year to make it a very special year our senior year and we worked out uh, like maniacs in the off season um, we all got together Monday Wednesday Friday underneath the stands at Beverly High School and the Lodge Fieldhouse and lifted weights um, banging weights around for three days a week and we all thought we were pretty strong, and I think, I think we were. I will say the strongest person there, though, was Coach Hamer. Um, <laughs> Joe, going into his senior year, had a, had a phenomenal senior year. Uh, Tommy Hayes was the quarterback, uh, very, very mobile, very strong arm. He had instant uh, chemistry with Joe. Um, and I think Joe's senior year, he had 38 catches for 660 yards and four touchdowns. And I won't kid around like Bernie did. I talked to Mr. Hamer earlier. Uh, Beverly was a primarily a running team. We had big linemen and incredible backs. But Mr. Hamer and also Hall of Fame coach Roger Rosinski, who was our offensive coordinator, saw the talent we had uh, throwing the football with Tommy and especially catching the football with Joe. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is uh, that year, um, we played a lot of uh, good teams and had really good players, and I'm going to just list a couple of those names. Um, we played Lynn Class School, had Tim Frazier, uh, was a running back who went to Boston College and set a special teams record there for kickoff return yards. Um, we played Peabody, who had Mike Ryan, who was a great running back at Peabody, and then at UNH. Uh, they had Dave Sapienza, who was a great linebacker, and then he went on to Syracuse. Uh, we played uh, Danvers who had Duke St. Pierre, who was a, a really good quarterback, went to Notre Dame, transferred to Boston College. Uh, Wally Dembowski, um, a wide receiver who Joe was often compared to. Wally had a great career at Holy Cross. Uh, David Bavaro played for that team. David went to Syracuse and played five years in the NFL. Uh, we played against Swampscott. Ed Toner played for Swampscott. He was a running back who went to Boston College, played three years in the NFL. And um, probably the best player we played against was Steve Staffier from Winthrop who went to the University of Miami, the U, who had just come off of a national championship. And the reason I bring those names up is because Joe Miller, uh, the, son, the only son of Joe and Rosina Miller, um, was as good or better than any of those players. Thank you very much.
Joe Miller, class of 1984. Right. Um, just a one quick comment, Christian. I, I saw you play a couple times, and uh, I really loved loved the way you played. Hard, good, very good player. So, following up on Steve's comment, uh, very well done. Really enjoyed watching you. Um, okay. Um, the next inductee, Lon Hamer, class of 1989, football and lacrosse. As a lacrosse player, Lon anchored a defense that went 18-0 and and won the Eastern Mass Conference Championship. Accomplishments and lacks also included a, a three-year starter, elected captain his senior year, and earned all NEC all-star honors as a junior as well as a senior. As a football player, Lon was a captain for one of the best teams in BHS history and anchored an offensive line that amassed over 2,300 rushing yards during the season. As a senior, he made the NEC All-Star team and won the McPherson Award. He even earned the high praise of great line coach and very tough critic Peter Harrington for his steady and hard-nosed play. And of course, you know, Lon being the son of a great coach, uh, walking in his brother's footsteps as a great football player, I mean, for most of us, that's a lot of pressure. Uh, but you know, for Lon, with his cool, calm, and collective manner, uh, he did it his own way and he did it well. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lon Hamer to the BHS Hall of Fame. Wow. Um, thanks, Bernie. Appreciate that. And it's hard to follow. <laughs> All right. It's hard to follow those that went before me. They did such such a good job. Um, I'm going to stick to my script because uh, if I don't, I'll go way off base. And uh, so, uh, and I think if I do this right, it'll be seven or eight minutes, I don't know. Um, I will say, Bernie told me I only had five minutes. Um, but uh, I did find out there was a little more time. Uh, he must have been accounting for hammer time. Uh, more likely, um, he's just being a typical running back. Probably thought five minutes was plenty of time for a lineman. What could a lineman possibly say that was interesting for some, someone uh, as someone in a skilled position? Such an annoying phrase, skilled position. <laughs> but I digress. Uh, if all you heard was, this is legendary head football coach uh, son, you might think you're about to hear from the starting quarterback from the 1988 football team. Uh, when my dad said he saw me handling the ball every play, I didn't realize that he meant I'd play center for the offensive line. <laughs> Truth is, I was raised to be a lineman, and my dad wouldn't have had it any other way. Uh, no matter how good my arm was, and it was pretty good, Dad. <laughs> just, just saying. Uh, uh, this is a special day. I feel privileged to be here. Uh, I want to start by thanking the Hall of Fame Induction Committee for recognizing my accomplishments in sports at Beverly High School. Uh, I'm honored to, I'm honored and humbled by this induction. I also want to congratulate the other inductees who are here today and the Hall of Famers in the room. Uh, it's an honor to be joining such an accomplished group. Uh, I'm, so, I'm also lucky to have several of my 1988 football season coaches, teammates here for the recognition of our 10-0 sweep of the Northeastern Conference. Uh, I want to give special thanks to my family, my amazing girlfriend, Megan, um, her wonderful family, my world-class friends for all the support on this long, strange trip. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank my coaches and the other sports staff individually. Uh, Coach Rick Mize, lacrosse, John Giacomo, lacrosse, uh, Dad, Hago, Roger Rosinski, John Allen, Al DiPaolo, John Corrado, Reggie Brown, Harry Connaughton, Tony DiVincenzo, Gunnar Pope, Paul Kloon, Roy Norton, and Red Hutt. My teachers and coaches from clinic football through Babe Ruth baseball all helped to form the person that I've become, so you can blame them. <laughs> I certainly do. As you may know, I was raised in a sports family. Well, let's be honest, I was raised in a football family. I'm profoundly grateful for the love, support I received while growing up and continue to benefit every day. It made me a better student, a better athlete, and a better friend. 
It didn't take long after leaving the nest to figure out how truly blessed I am to have been raised in such a special home, grounded in discipline, honor, and integrity. I was given the tools to succeed. I have amazing siblings and my brother Bill and sister Dina and the best parents a guy could ask for. Uh, there was my sister-in-law Lisa too, uh, who was a member of the family since I was eight and arguably the best influence of them all. Uh, as an A student and two-sport captain, my brother Bill showed me the blueprint for a successful high school career. He set the bar high for both my sister and I, and I have to curse him and thank him as there was no taking the foot off the gas if I was going to walk in his shadow. And that, was, and that pressure brought out the best of me. While Coach Hamer was busy turning Beverly's youth into men, I was in the hands of the real boss of 16 Warren Street, my mom, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Um, from my mom, I learned that her home state of Michigan was the center of the universe, and any of my good genetics and traits came from her side of the family. Um, my mom was the enforcer at home, and my dad was her muscle. They worked as a team, which may best be explained by her actions one fall afternoon in 1988. Uh, it was mid-season, and I was fighting a cold. Unbeknownst to me, she stopped by practice as the coaches were taking the field and told Hago, my line coach, that I wasn't feeling well and he should take it easy on me. <laughs> this is the wife of a career football coach. Obviously she knew I'd get my ass kicked. <laughs> uh, I guess she thought I needed toughening up to finish the season strong. You'll hear a lot about the great football team I played on when Winston takes over uh, in a minute. You should all know this already, but I had the privilege of blocking for the greatest running back of all time in Beverly football history. Winston Treffrey, Kevin Pesowitz, Dana Peters, and Jay Shears are all assuming I'm talking about them. <laughs> and there are probably a few more in the crowd, like Bernie, that are doing the math because I must be talking about them. Uh, to each of you I say, of course it's you. <laughs> uh, I could go on and on about the football teams I played on, the friends and laughs, but I don't want to steal Winston's thunder. Uh, I will say that my greatest honor was to be voted tri-captain by my football and lacrosse teammates. They're having a good time behind us, right? <laughs> I, don't know. I think we all need to head over there after this. Uh, I also had the fortune of playing for some of the best lacrosse teams in Beverly history. Uh, if you know my dad, it's no shock that when I told him I wanted to play lacrosse, he thought it would be a great off-season sport for me to get ready for football. Uh, there were no youth lacrosse teams back in the day, so like almost everyone else that played lacrosse in Beverly before me, I picked up a lacrosse stick the summer before my freshman year. Uh, so as to not completely be embarrass myself at tryouts, uh, it was suggested that I go down to the high school and throw the ball across against the field house wall. I ran into a guy I hadn't seen since elementary school, Matt Arciaga, uh, who was doing the same thing. Matt and I hit it off, and I was psyched to have a friend on the lacrosse team, knowing that most of my friends were staying with baseball. Matt turned out to be a lacrosse natural and got scooped up for varsity at the end of tryouts, but luckily for me, lacrosse is a contact sport where clubbing people with a stick is legal, so there were plenty of like-minded guys from every fall and winter sport joining me on the lacrosse field. Uh, Coach Mazzei brought me up to varsity for the playoffs that year, and Matt and I played together on defense for the next three years and ended our high school lacrosse careers as tri-captains along with Dana Peters. I single Matt out because although his spirit lives, with, lives on with many of us, he passed away over 20 years ago now. I, along with several here today, considered Matt a best friend. Arcy, as he was known, was larger than life, and those that knew him are better for it. One of the many great benefits of sports is that you form friendships in unlikely places that last a lifetime. I wouldn't trade my days with Matt at the, at the wall and on the team for anything. I play with so many great lacrosse players at Beverly that I can't mention them all. 
You'll meet some of them when the 88 football team gets up here. And to the rest, I say thanks for the memories. How do I compete with that? Right? Um, I loved lacrosse and had so much fun playing. When I told my dad how much fun lacrosse was, he told me, sports aren't supposed to be fun. It's, a, it's about discipline and pushing yourself, perseverance and mental, and, uh, mental toughness. At the time, I thought, wow, is my dad insane? Yeah. What happened to make him so jaded? He knew that we'd all get our fair share of adversity as we ventured outside our safe havens. And he knew many of his players didn't have safe havens to begin with. Uh, he was doing his part to prepare us. We can all sit here now and appreciate what our coaches knew about life and what they were doing for us. Sports gave us the tools to navigate life's hazards and to mentally deal with the highs and the lows. This will come as a shock. This will come as a shock to those of you who know my father, but he can't stand the excessive celebration, the trash talk, and the poor sportsmanship that some professional athletes display. He doesn't have to say it anymore because it's burned into my subconscious, but he does anyways. <laughs> Act like you've been there before. Do your talking with your pads. Don't live on your laurels. Coach Mazze and my other coaches all preach similar message, and even today I rely on their words as tools to guide me. The losses and gains on, on the fields are traded in for different losses and gains in our adult lives. Most are far more serious, and we are, but we are better prepared for them because of our time in the trenches with our brothers, our teammates, and our friends. We act like we've been there before. In many ways, we have. That's, thank you very much. <laughs> Ron Hamer, class of 1989. Okay, we're getting down to the home stretch. Uh, next inductee, Matthew McGinnity, class of 1996, hockey and lacrosse. When I think about my athletic journey, one word that comes to mind is investment. You know, um, investment in the coach, you know, the coaches. They don't get enough credit. Um, you know, they're always there. They do more than just teach a game, a sport, whether it's hockey, football, lacrosse. It doesn't matter, tennis, track. You know, these people are mentors. They made a commitment, and it's usually lifelong. It's what they, um, it's what they do, you know. And for the most part, the guys that I know, they make a change, and they change lives one person at a time. Uh, um, you know, being, um, you know, uh, like I broke a lot of records, I've done a lot of things, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, a lot of people, I've played on a lot of great teams. Um, but I think I learned more about um, myself um, when I actually thought back and wrote this speech about, you know, all these coaches and, and all that they do. Um, as I became to realize, um, Beverly High School formed a foundation in the athletic department for my whole life. And that's just because people invested in me, you know. I had the privilege of playing under great coaches and beside many great players. I did play varsity uh, in hockey and lacrosse in all four years of my time at BHS. And I played under coaches uh, Mike Daring, Larry Jacobs, and Peter Shea in hockey. And Rick Mazze, Peter Janolfi, as well as many assistants in lacrosse. Um, and I just want to thank all of them for their sacrifice 
and their time and focusing all their energy on making not only myself, but our entire team better. Not just players, but people. Men of integrity, men of honor, men of respect. Um, things that you just don't, you know, it's not as commonplace today as it should be. And um, all that structure just made me the, the person that I am today. They had a big impact on my life. Um, and something that stuck with me was Coach Mazze. You know, I played lacrosse for Coach Mazze. If you if you played lacrosse for Coach Mazze, then you know, you know, he was a maniac. He was jumping up and down, very intense, awesome speeches. Um, he's the guy that gave me confidence. You know. He's the guy that made his investment in me. My freshman year, when I came on, you know, I was just another kid. Um, I was, you know, I was in shop classes, and I was, just, you know, I started playing lacrosse. And Coach Mazzei, you know, he saw me and he's like, "Wow, this kid can uh, he, he can play some lacrosse here. Let's see what we can do." He met with um, Steve Sheriff at the time, with my guidance counselor. Next thing I know. You know, I'm in college prep classes. I mean, I had learning disabilities. I had a lot of stuff going on. So, you know, I, I was intimidated, you know. And then, you know, he said I could do it. He sponsored me to go to a, a lacrosse camp that year, which just further built my confidence. Um, you know, I went to college prep classes. I did all that. And it all ended up working out. Um, but it's, it's also more than that, too. One thing that comes to mind was that when I was playing varsity and I was the smallest kid on the team as a sophomore, Coach Mazze he put all the confidence in me. He pulled the team together, you know, winning, losing, you know, especially if we were losing. He tell everybody else, get McGinn into the ball and get open. He'll take care of the rest. And I did. You know, he put the pressure on, and I rose to the occasion, time and time again, and executed. You know, and because of this, because of, you know, it seems small, but you know, when I look back, it was huge. It conditioned me for the rest of my life. Um, that developed me into the fierce competitor that I became, you know, on and off the field, and now in business. You know, uh, in all of the sports in Beverly High School, we used to have these catchphrases that they used to use, you know, dig deep, get there, then rest. You know, in this attitude, in this way of thinking, you know, as well as the mentorship and time and the investment that all these coaches made, it not only helped me to f f fulfill my potential in sports, but it gave me the work ethic and the ability to overcome uh, many adversities in life. You know, it's been quite a journey. And it's helped me to become a success. But the most important thing is, you know, it's legacy. Because now that I'm a dad and I have kids, and this isn't even script, you know, this is just over with. I can't do it anymore. But I coach, and being a coach now, um, I understand, you know, what all my coaches did for me. You know, because a coach is not just a coach, like I said, it's everything else in between. Um, but, but, you know, I can pass on all the coaching that I received onto my children and all those values as well, you know, as well as receiving this award. They're here to see me, you know, accept that accomplishment, which is great.
and I'm very thankful for that. Um, in closing, I just want to congratulate um, everybody here, um, all the inductees, and both past and present. Um, my mom and dad, all my all my family that, that's here, um, especially my uncle Louis. Without him, I wouldn't be playing lacrosse. You know, I, he's the guy right there that gave me my first lacrosse stick. I, I believe it was a it was a Brian Mesh uh, Super Late Two, which I had for I don't know how many years until until it broke. So, um, but, but but just like um, you know everything else, um, I also want to. Um, like my grandfather, we call him Gramps. He's no longer there. He is. I, I knew he was here. I knew he was here. I'm telling you what the funny story is, right? He um, this guy never missed a game. Hockey, all my hockey games never missed a game. All my lacrosse games, screaming in the stands. Never missed a game. He was my number one fan. He's also the reason why I'm standing here tonight. Um, you know, he, he was a major, major player in um, me being an athlete here. So, and lastly, um, I also want to thank one more person that I played with that I really love playing with that's not here tonight and it, that's Ben Murray um, they called us the papers locally here called us the uh, dynamic duo and we piggybacked on each other game after game scoring assists this and that and it was awesome and um, I just want to mention that as well so thank you very much that's okay it's okay. It's all right. Matt McGinnity, class of 1996. Great message, Matt. Thank you. Okay, one more uh, inductee, a super fast inductee, by the way. And then we'll get to the outstanding football team, which I know will make Winnie very happy. Lance Wagner, class of 2000. Soccer, indoor, and outdoor track. As a top performer in soccer, Lance was a great sweeper for BHS. He won the coach's award his senior year, was part of three state tournament teams, and earned an all-star spot in the Aganis game. In track is where Lance had his greatest successes and earned the reputation as one of the best sprinters in BHS history. A career filled with many school and class records, such as best times in the 55 meter as a freshman and sophomore, best time in the 300 meter as a junior and senior, the 400 meter record as a senior, and in an outdoor track he holds school records for the 100 meter and the 200 meter races, as well as the freshman long jump record. Other career accomplishments and accolades include elected team captain, indoor and outdoor, NEC MVP, indoor and outdoor, Class B state and New England meet qualifier as a junior and a senior, and breaking the Class B 300 meter record. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lance Wagner to the BHS Hall of Fame. Thank you. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> what an honor. Uh, thank you so much to the committee. Um, I always hoped that this would happen. I never thought it would really happen, <laughs> but here I am, so I must have done something right. Um, first of all, I just want to say uh, thank you to my parents. Uh, numerous rides everywhere, uh, travel teams, they never missed a game, uh, they never missed a meet. Uh, even when I was in college, uh, they never missed one meet. Thank you. Um, I want to thank my coaches. Um, two of my coaches, um, Beverly High School graduates and uh, Coach Steve Sheriff, my soccer coach, 
and Coach Nelson De Silvestri, my track coach, um, fellow Hall of Famers. Um, so they must have done something right. Um, and uh, my uh, my college coaches, uh, Paul Souza and Richard Curry. Uh, these guys pushed me to do things that I didn't think I could do, um, and I will be forever grateful to them um, for believing in me. Um, I want to thank my uh, my teammates uh, and my friends. Um, you guys may not have known this, but you guys made me better because I want to impress you so badly. Um, <laughs> and I realize now, looking back, that it probably didn't matter if I finished last, if I finished first, if I broke a record, whatever. You guys were going to see me as who I am, and it didn't matter. Um, so I just want to say thank you guys so much. Um, my, my brother was my teammate, which was, you know, if anybody's ever played, you know, sports, it's really cool to have your brother play with you. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just, a, just an absolute, absolute uh, wild ride and fun ride. Um, yeah, I don't really have much prepared, huh? <laughs> I was really struggling to figure out what I was going to say. Um, you know, the baby of the bunch, I guess, here. Graduated in 2000. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I haven't had too much time to reflect on my, my high school career. Um, maybe in about another five, ten years, maybe I'll have more to say, more to think about. But, uh, um, you know, I look at the picture, you know, over there of me running, and I really wish my wife could have seen what I looked like. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, you guys, you guys probably thought that I was like a shot putter or something. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, 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 maybe, maybe uh, someday. Um, I still have a year of eligibility in college. Um, I, uh, my college career actually ended um, after my junior year. Um, tore up my hamstring pretty bad and made the decision to stop running. Um, which was not a decision that I made lightly. Um, I, if I couldn't run at the level that I wanted to run, uh, I just wasn't, my heart wasn't into it, so I, I gave that up. Um, so this is a really cool way to kind of end my career uh, by receiving such an incredible honor. Um, you know, joining, I look around this room and I see the Beverly High School history uh, and to be a part of that is just, I, I, my mind can't, I can't get my, my mind around that, that I'm actually a part of this. Um, and I will be forever, forever grateful for this. Um, so thank you for letting me end my, um, my track career here uh, <laughs> and not limping off the track. Um, so thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it. Lance Wagner, class of 2000. So I, I do want to um, comment with uh, the speakers, the inductees. It's pretty noisy back here. I don't know if you can hear it. And everyone's done a really good job dealing with the noise, trying to concentrate on the speech. So again, great job. So we are, you happy, Winnie? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, that concludes our induct individual inductees for this year. Um, now it's my honor to introduce and honor the 1988 BHS football team. Yeah. With a perfect 10-0 regular season, the 1988 football team was the first team in BHS history to go to the Super Bowl. Although this team was certainly loaded with talent with eight BHS Hall of Fame players on the squad and led by three Hall of Fame coaches, what really propelled them to the next level was a great camaraderie and do your job mentality. And by the way, Bill Belichick stole that from me, do your job, I didn't steal that from him. Uh, highlight wins for the season included overcoming a halftime deficit to defeat Lynn English early in the season, a late fourth quarter win against a very talented Marblehead team, a thumping of Swamp Scott in a late matchup of 8-0 teams, 
and defeating arch rival Salem to secure the perfect season. As we honor this team this evening, we'd also like to remember two key members of the squad uh, who we lost way too early as fine young men. Uh, Matt Arciaga, who uh, Lon spoke about a little bit, um, as well as Brian, affectionately called Psycho Richards. Um, they were certainly very good, outstanding football players, uh, but they were even better people. So ladies and gentlemen, let's please welcome the 1988 BHS football team. Yeah, why don't you guys come on up together, come on up. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, hey, Kevin. Hey, buddy. Good evening, folks. Uh, I, I'm not going to be long here. Winnie gave me a few minutes here to to address the group, and uh, <clears throat> I just want to um, uh, let's see. First of all, what was I thinking of here when I? Come up, uh, no, I, <laughs> I'm a little, I lost my train of thought here. But uh, no, uh, uh, thinking of uh, Tommy Donovan standing up here, Tom, you know, I, I was mentioned in the same category as I know the history of uh, Beverly Sports, and I, I do know a lot about Beverly Sports and that Tom is really the, the man that could tell you, he could have got up here and, and talked for everybody, you know, because he knows that much about what's going on in Beverly. And I find, uh, as we listened on here, uh, Steve Pascucci uh, could join right in with him because Steve did such a nice job up here paying honor to our, our great, a great player, you know, uh, and, and this was, you know, this was... Uh, this, that was special, you know. I really, Joe Miller was an outstanding football player and very committed uh, to uh, his training. He did what you had to do. He was a real team player and a great athlete. Nobody worked harder than Joe did. Um, I do want to say, um, you know, the great uh, Vince Lombardi, the NFL coach. Uh, uh, he uh, he made a comment about. Uh, team play here, uh, you know, it's being an individual uh, effort or an, uh, or an individual uh, com commitment to uh, uh, a physical effort, you know, to, um, uh, which really, me, which is really uh, uh, what makes a team work. And this particular team right here, the 88 team, uh, they were an outstanding group of athletes, but the thing was that they they genuinely loved each other and cared about each other, and that's why they were so successful. Um, and, and you've got to have that kind of uh, feeling within the team, you know, when you really, they wanted to do it for each other. You know, if things weren't going right, they would pick each other up, and that's why they were so successful, you know. And... Um, Beyond that, that's really what I wanted to say. Winnie, uh, Winnie will talk, talk about the season here, but uh, also uh, I was fortunate through those years to have a great coaching staff. I mean, we have Coach Roger Rosinski and John Allen, Peter Harrington, Al DiPaolo, some uh, great, uh, really, they're, they're, the, they're the ones that did it, you know, really. It was, uh, we had a great staff and we worked so well together. So with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Win. you know, he's prepared for this here. I do. <laughs> okay, yeah, no. I went. Get over here. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, okay, Get buddy. Over. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, this is my second time talking at this, and it's my second time going last. And it's my first time following Coach Hamer. So, what I hope to do is take you systematically through the 1988 season, play by agonizing play. <laughs> it should only take 45 or 50 minutes. <laughs> Lucky for you, I'm just kidding. Give me seven minutes of your time. All right, Beverly, here we go. The 80s were one of the heydays of Beverly football. When all of us from 88 were little panther pups, we played down at Balch Park for the Pee Wees, Youth League, and Pup Warner. We played for coaches named Castellucci, Dean, Churchill, Junta, Fields, Corrado, 
On Saturday afternoons, we'd ride our bikes, walk, or get dropped off at Hurd Stadium to see our Panther Idols play. Our Panther Idols were people named Durgan, Beretti, Miller, Shields, Pewter, Hayes, Dooling, Flaherty, Morency, Geary, Stanwood, Junta, Papin, Dreo, Pascucci, Lord, Harrington, Barra, Bates, and McLeod. <laughs> Monsters, one and all. Yeah, Beverly always had a win winning team back in those days and never lost the physical battle. We watched the black and orange with pride and our eyes filled with tears with heartbreaking losses to Gloucester in 84, Swampscott in 85, Winthrop in the early 80s, seemingly every time we went over the Salem Beverly Bridge to take on those bastards. <laughs> You all know who I'm talking about. <laughs> we were always so close to being perfect. Coach Hamer used to drive an old beat up green pickup truck. Rusty with mag wheels. It was a perfect rig for a hard nosed Beverly icon. And I think at one time or another, all of us sat there and watched him drive around town and said to ourselves, I'm going to play for that guy someday. <laughs> we finally got to high school, signed up for freshman football, and began our journeys as Beverly High School Panthers. Getting our first taste of double sessions, we learned that football is really hard and not always fun. We grinded it out week after week, game after game, and somewhere along the line, Coach Brown taught us that there ain't nothing like winning. All right, we're going to do it. <laughs> We're gonna do it. When are we gonna get this chance again? Here we go. <laughs> Nothing like winning. We're winning. We're winning. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was sort of awful. <laughs> I need Beverly. Here we go, Beverly. All right, here's the story behind it. When we were freshmen and got off, got on the bus after a win. Coach Brown would come in at somewhere where along the line and say, not like win it. And then we'd all refrain, win, win, win it. <laughs> so Bev, here we go. All right. On the count of three. Actually, not on the count of three. I'm just going to do it. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> win, win, win? No, no, no. Not like win it. All right, what are we, Mobblehead? Are we cool? No, Beverly runs hot. Let's go, one more time. Nothing like winning. Winning. And I think at the end of that year, we said, you know what, we're pretty freaking good. We went 9-0, and blew out every team by double digits, and uh, I forgot where it was. Oh, yeah. All right. We were winning. Yeah. We were winning. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I just, I didn't even read it. <laughs> we went on to our sophomore and junior years to learn the first hand that when you hear the words, hey, pal, hey, pal, let me tell you something, it wasn't good. <laughs> and that ye is the key to the NEC, to scallum. That hump day is always happy, to get them chopping, that we should never live on our laurels, or oh, be fat cats. <laughs> get them chopping, get them chopping. <laughs> Hat day is a holiday, karaoke on the backside, and that Donnie Bartlett always marks the spot, baby. Yeah, baby. <laughs> I'd give anything to see Donnie Bartlett riding down Rantoul Street, big butt hanging off the back. I think Donnie may be the only person in human existence that chain smoked while riding a bike. They don't make him like Donnie anymore. Cheers, Donnie. Cheers, Donnie. Cheers.
As time went on, we got to the point where our old coaches and Panther heroes were now watching and rooting for us. Coach Hamer, Coach Rosinski, Coach Hago, Coach Allen, Coach DiPaolo, Mr. Hutt, and the, were the perfect blend of men to mentor, coach, inspire, guide, and teach 17-year-old bo boys how to conduct themselves as young men, play football tough, and to be better people. Playing for them did not make you a good person, but it made you a better person than you would have been. They protected us without coddling us, which is a lost art. And uh, let me tell you something. The 80s were not tame times. <laughs> there were a lot of rough characters down that practice pit. You know, some of which needed the uh, attention of the penal system <laughs> at some point in their lives. But not down there. There was no, you know, swearing, no asking what position you play, respect all the way. Our senior year was a dream come true. We worked as hard as we could for three straight years. I can remember walking out of the visitors clubhouse for our first game at the old Everett Field. It was hot, 90 degrees, standing there with Costa, Hamer, Shazzy, Youngie, Richards, Jalbert, Pizowitz, Rivers, Consul, Forrest, Mott, Peters, Assi, Psycho, and Whitey. I think we knew right then and there what we were about to go do. We learned from, avenged, and atoned from all the 80 teams past, ripping through Gloucester, Winthrop, English, Classical, Everett, Danvers, winning a nail-biter against Marblehead, setting up a showdown with undefeated Swampskit, both teams 8-0 in one of the biggest games in Northeast Conference history. We beat them 34-14, taking the conference and turning Big Blue into big babies. <laughs> we stole their stupid skull and crossbones flag, and we really did. The, tra <laughs> the trade school kids got it, gave it to us, and we had it in the locker room after the game. It was awesome. It's the little things in life. <laughs> We capped off the season with a hard-fought victory over Salem, completed Beverly's first 10-win season, putting the cherry on the top of the Hammer 80s. <laughs> we are, to this day, so glad we did. So proud for honoring us. Um, it gives us a chance to see each other again. The bonds that are made through this experience never end and are never broken. I just want to give a quick shout out to all the honorees tonight. Thank you. Um, I read it in the paper, you know, what you guys did. I can't believe it took this long. I mean, amazing people, amazing feats. And I'm going to give a specific shout out to uh, Lon Hamer, who uh, was a, uh, a great teammate and an um, even better friend. Yeah. Our final game was a loss <laughs> to Drake it in the Super Bowl at the old Foxborough Stadium. It stunk. It still stinks, and it's always going to stink. But recently, the 1988 football team were honored by the Salem News as the fifth best team in any sport at Beverly High School over the past 45 years. And of those five teams, we are the only team that didn't win the state title. <laughs> so, that makes us the best of the losers. <laughs> Number one. And as Jalbert and Shazzy would say, think about it. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ray. For RC Psycho and Kristen Z. Yes, sir. All right. You don't see that every year. <laughs> Woo!
And uh, that, by the way, that's 100% natural. Thank you. Let's hear it one last time for the 1988 BHS football team. Okay, well, um, bad news, you don't have to listen to me anymore. Um, this concludes our evening. I want to thank everybody for, of course, coming out and supporting these tremendous athletes. Um, eight new great athletes inducted into the Hall of Fame, um, as well as, of course, the 1988 football team. Let's give them one last applause, please. So congratulations again. Uh, everybody have a great evening. Thank you for coming. Hope to see you next year. Take care, everybody. Thank you.